This video is gonna continue our talk on lung physiology. So in a previous video, we said you take a deep breath in, oxygen fills your alveoli, and that oxygen goes into your blood, where it's picked up by a red blood cell. And we said not every single molecule of oxygen goes into your blood, but enough goes. And uh, your red blood cells will pick it up, go to your tissue, and release that oxygen. All is well. Now, how does your red blood cells do that? Well, they have something called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is in two forms. One is called the tau form, and that loves to release oxygen, release oxygen. All right, a uh, fancy way of saying this is that it has a low affinity for oxygen. It doesn't want to be around in oxygen. It wants to release it, it wants to release it. The second form is the relaxed form, relaxed form. The relaxed form loves to pick up O2. This is usually our default form. Usually your red blood cells are circling around your blood in this form and wants to pick up oxygen. Wants to pick it up. Fancy way of saying this is that it has a high affinity for oxygen. High affinity. It really, really likes to bind oxygen. Really, really likes to pick it up. Okay? So it's circling in your blood in the relaxed form until it goes to your alveoli and it'll pick up oxygen. And then once it goes to your tissue, it'll turn into the tau form, turn into the tau form, and then release that oxygen. Release that oxygen. How does it know when to turn shapes? It doesn't have a brain. All right? So it'll pick up oxygen and then go to your tissue. And we'll start to notice these different types of chemicals, these different types of chemical mediators. And that's when it says, this tissue needs oxygen. And then it'll turn into a tau form and release oxygen. What are these chemical mediators? Um, the easiest way I remember it is I think of someone that's exercising really hard, exercising really hard. When they're exercising really hard, their tissue makes, make, makes, makes lactic acid, so H plus. Their tissue makes a lot of byproducts like CO2. Their tissue, is has is at an increased temperature. Don't you get really hot when you exercise? And then something less intuitive, um, a lot of cells, even your red blood cells, um, when they're in hypoxia, they release a compound called 2,3-BPG. 2,3-BPG. So that's a hypoxia. Or any causes of hypoxia. It doesn't have to be exercise. It could be like high altitude. High altitude. Or you're just not getting enough oxygen. So your red blood cells, in its relaxed form, will pick up oxygen go to this tissue, see all these chemical mediators and say, oh no, this tissue really needs oxygen. Turn into its tau form, release that oxygen. And then once it leaves these chemical mediators, it'll turn back to its default form, turn back to its relaxed form, start the cycle over again. Not too bad. Um, let's draw it graphically. Let's draw it graphically. I don't even know if graphically is a correct term, but I've been using it so, so many, so many videos, it's too late to turn back now. So on the Y axis, we have O2 sat. O2 saturation. On the X axis, we have pressure of O2. And so you will pick up oxygen. It'll look like this. Um, when you get to all these chemical mediators, you'll want to release oxygen. You'll want to release that oxygen. And now your graph kind of looks like this. Why does it look like this? Well, well, when you well when you release oxygen. When you release oxygen, does that increase or decrease oxygen saturation? Well, decrease it. You're no longer saturated. You've released all that oxygen. So if we take any amount of oxygen we've given the patient, it'll normally cause this much saturation. But in tissues where we really, really want to release that oxygen, where we really, really want to get rid of that oxygen, we'll take that same amount of oxygen that we've given the patient, and we'll notice that it's less saturated, you've released all that oxygen. So your curve now looks like this. Sometimes we call it right shift, right shift, right shift. And it's due to all these chemical mediators. So H plus, CO2, increased temp, 2,3 BPG, high altitude, the whole nine yards. And the opposite is true, the opposite is true. Once your red blood cell leave this and no longer find these mediators, then it'll Go back to a relaxed form. In fact, if you have alkalosis, if you have low CO2, if you have decreased temp, if you have decreased 2,3 BPG, it'll want to bind oxygen more. And it'll want to pick up oxygen more. Does that decrease or does that increase oxygen saturation? It'll increase oxygen saturation. You're really saturated. We want to pick it up more. And now your new curve, if you really want to pick up oxygen, looks kind of like this. Yeah? Wants to keep oxygen, wants to be really saturated with oxygen. 
So if we take the same amount of oxygen that we give the patient, you'll find out that they're now really, really saturated. Sometimes we call this left shift. So if someone says left shift or right shift to curves, that's what they mean. That is what they mean. Now why does this curve look like this? Why does it look sigmoidal? It looks sigmoidal because your hemoglobin binds to four molecules of oxygen. All right, sigmoidal. And when it binds to the first, it makes it easier to bind to the second, which makes it easier to bind to the third. So it goes whoop, kind of sigmoidal, okay? We call that positive cooperation. Not everything does this. Your myoglobin, which also also combine um, oxygen, doesn't do this. Doesn't do this. It just kind of kind of binds it and then levels out. So this top graph will be your myoglobin. Myoglobin. I've seen um, I've seen charts. You probably can't read this, but this says myoglobin. Okay. I've seen charts where none of this is labeled, and they'll just show this myoglobin chart and say where is this found? It's found in your muscles. Okay. Found in your muscles. Is there anything else I want to talk about on that subject? No, I think that does it. Let's talk about some hemoglobin pathologies. Uh, things can go wrong with your hemoglobin, especially if something else binds to your hemoglobin instead of oxygen, or if your hemoglobin changes structural shape. Right? If it changes shape, then it doesn't bind oxygen as well. Let's talk about the first thing. Um, something binding to your hemoglobin that's not oxygen. Big one is carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide loves to bind to hemoglobin. It has a very high affinity. High affinity. So if this is your, if this is your hemoglobin, and you have your uh, four little molecules of oxygen, two, three, four, carbon monoxide sees this hemoglobin, says, I love hemoglobin, and will bind to it. Sit on top of it. Sit on top of it and doesn't let your oxygen get released keeps it there, keeps it there. Your oxygen can't get released. Does that right shift your curve or does that left shift your curve? Right shift is when you release oxygen, when it hits all these things, right? So it will left shift your curve. All right, CO, CO carbon monoxide. So all right, left shift, left shift. Now here's the thing, here's the tricky thing. Um, do these people look cyanotic, do they look blue? Cyanosis is due to desaturated hemoglobin. This, you look pretty saturated to me. It's just that your oxygen just can't leave. It's getting sat on by this giant carbon monoxide, all right? So uh, they don't look cyanotic. In fact, they look red. They look red. Sometimes they call it cherry red. And that can be very tricky. You have someone with hypoxia that looks red. Looks red. So the first sign is actually not going to be skin changes, but it's going to be headaches. Now, how do they like to ask carbon monoxide poisoning on the step? Uh, carbon monoxide poisoning is often seen in portable heaters, so portable heaters. Or people that use heat in enclosed space, so people that are living in their garage. Back then, uh, a, way, a common way people would try and commit suicide is they leave their car running in a closed garage and then that carbon monoxide would build. So garage is a big one. Or if an entire family gets exposed, you have a whole family with hypoxia and you're like, okay, this is not, this is not normal. So family with hypoxia. And then the biggest one is um, a house fire. Release a lot of carbon monoxide, you get carbon monoxide poisoning, so house fire. House fires also release a lot of cyanide, cyanide. Not because fire releases cyanide, but um, your upholstery, your tapestry has cyanide compounds, which is not a problem until it goes up into flames and then it releases it everywhere. So you can have cyanide poisoning. Also, how do you treat it? How do you treat it? Give oxygen, give oxygen. If you give enough oxygen, it'll displace that CO and all will be well, all right? That's our first hemoglobin pathology. Our next one is gonna be methemoglobin. Take that. Hemoglobin has iron in it, in the form of Fe2+, and that Fe2+, can be oxidized, that's the like O-chem term. You're like, oh no, O-chem. <laughs> it can be oxidized in the Fe3+. Fe3+, doesn't bind oxygen. No, it doesn't bind oxygen. If it can't bind oxygen, you get hypoxia. Absolutely right. Uh, what are some things that can oxidize this? Well, you have to give oxidizing agents like nitrites, that's um, commonly found in streams. So if someone goes hiking, drinks water from the stream, and then develops hypoxia. All right, streams. Aniline dye. So someone working in a dye factory, I was probably, uh, what am I right? Factory. 
Um, Dapsone. Dapsone is a anti-tuberculosis drug. So a patient has all the signs of TB. Pause the video, tell me everything you know about TB. <laughs> You're probably gonna be here for a long time, but I want you to do that. If, especially if micro is your, I guess, your weak point. So a patient comes in with everything, all these signs of TB, and you give them a drug, and then suddenly they develop hypoxia. Think of Dapsone. Think of methamoglobin, okay? All right, TB drug. TB drug. And when your hemoglobin changes this form, it turns kind of dark. Kind of looks like chocolate. So someone will have chocolate blood. That is a dead giveaway. Not often do you see people with chocolate blood. Now you see someone with chocolate blood um, hypoxia, how do you treat it? Treat it with methylene blue. Not too hard to remember, they both start with meth. If you, if you watch Breaking Bad, you know that the meth is blue. Uh, Methylene blue is a reducing agent. Yeah, it reduces back to Fe2+. I mean, you know the problem. You know it's getting oxidized to Fe3+. So how do you think you're gonna fix it? You're gonna reduce it back to Fe2+, all as well. A uh, theoretical thing that they want you to know is that while methylglobin can't bind oxygen, it loves to bind to our good friend cyanide. Loves to bind to cyanide, all right, bind to cyanide. So you can see this in a lot of cyanide kits, cyanide antidote kits, in the form of Nitrite plus sodium thiosulfate. So a person comes in with cyanide poison, you give them the nitrite, which will oxidize their blood into methemoglobin. And that will bind up all the cyanide, bind up all the cyanide. And then you'll give them this thiosulfate, which will turn that cyanide into something that is water soluble. You'll pee it all out, pee it all out. And then you can just reduce back the methemoglobin Done. Done. All right, that's a theoretical thing that they want you to know. So let's move on to our next topic. We said a lot of um, oxygen is bound to your hemoglobin, on your hemoglobin, and a very small percent, like 5%, is actually just dissolved elsewhere, elsewhere in your blood, okay? An equation they use to calculate both the oxygen dissolved in your blood and the oxygen that's found in your hemoglobin is gonna be Your hemoglobin saturation, so saturation O2 found in your hemoglobin, plus the pressure of oxygen just dissolved in your blood. All right, so we got we can calculate what's dissolved in your blood and what's bound to your hemoglobin. Now, the most, the majority of it, the majority of it, about 95%, is going to be bound to your hemoglobin, and so we times this by a larger number, 1.34. Very, very small amount is going to be found dissolved in blood. We times this by 1.003. And if you add the two, you can find out the total amount of oxygen in your blood. We can look at how different uh, situations affect this, this equation. Let's look at anemia. Anemia, you don't have enough hemoglobin. You have low hemoglobin. So how does that affect this equation? Does it affect the amount dissolved in your blood? No. Does it affect your saturation of hemoglobin? No. Whatever hemoglobin you have, it might not be a lot, but it can get saturated just fine. However, will it affect your hemoglobin? Yes. So it will only affect this portion of the equation because you have decreased hemoglobin. Common, common trick question, a patient has anemia, they're getting short of breath, exertional fatigue, they're pale, I almost said pallor, they're pale, and then you look down and then it might say like, is there something wrong with their O2 saturation? No, O2 saturation is completely fine. What they're looking for is there's just decreased hemoglobin. Because there's decreased hemoglobin, they're just not getting enough oxygen to your tissue, okay? They don't get tricked by that. Your oxygen saturation is completely fine in anemia. I believe that's all I wanna talk about O2. Now let's talk about our friend CO2. So we said you take a deep breath in, take a deep breath in, Oxygen's here, and oxygen goes to your blood, goes to your tissue, and then um, after you use up all the oxygen, you will release CO2 as a byproduct. And that CO2 moves back into your lung and you <sighs> breathe out that CO2. So let's talk about CO2, the other side of the coin, okay? 90% of CO2, 90% of CO2, is found in your red blood cells, in your red blood cells. And it's not actually found in the form of CO2, 
okay, is found in the form of something else. You see, in your red blood cells, in your red blood cells, you have something called carbonic anhydrase. And carbonic anhydrase works on carbonic acid. So you have hydrogen plus bicarb, and that forms carbonic acid. Carbonic acid. And you can guess the enzyme carbonic anhydrase is going to work on carbonic acid. All right, carbonic anhydrase will work on carbonic acid. And it will turn it into water and CO2. Your red blood cells have carbonic anhydrase that goes through this system. Yeah, it goes through this system. And it will find CO2, find CO2, and pick it up, pick it up. Once it picks up CO2, it will reverse the system and hold it as hydrogen and bicarb. And then once it finally goes to your lungs, it will reverse, turn itself back into CO2, and then you will release that CO2. So 90% of it goes through this process, this carbonic anhydrase process. 5% binds to globin, not heme, but globin. Globin. And then the rest of it is dissolved in your blood. Dissolved in your blood. And that is CO2, that is oxygen transport. Hope you enjoyed the video, thanks.